The biggest and most well-known sportswear manufacturer in the world is Nike. The desire for better shoes by one individual led to the creation of a $100 billion worldwide enterprise in just over 50 years. So this week on YT Pioneers, we're exploring Nike's early years to learn how that magic happened and what the key components were to their success. In 1962, Phil Knight had recently received his Stanford degree. Any business graduate will tell you that it's challenging to start your own business if you don't have any solid ideas, but Phil did. He used to run long distances in college, and in one of his business classes, he wrote an essay outlining the following concept, with the paper titled, Can Japanese Sport Shoes Do to German Sport Shoes What Japanese Cameras Did to German Cameras? Phil pondered whether Japanese shoes could dethrone Puma and Adidas, which were at the time hugely popular in America, in the same way that Japanese cameras had replaced the dominant German cameras in the US market. After finishing the paper and receiving his diploma, Phil developed an obsession with the notion of exporting Japanese shoes to the United States. In fact, he didn't actually have any Japanese running shoes, and the ones he had seen had been brought to the United States by troops stationed in Japan during the occupation that followed World War II. But Phil was encouraged that he had stumbled across a fantastic opportunity by this lack of exposure. He was aware that in order to benefit from it, he would need to make contact with the Japanese enterprise and negotiate the import of their products into America, both of which required skills he had never before encountered. Yet, fittingly for the man who would later invent Nike, he just went ahead and did it. He traveled to Japan by plane as a tourist in November 1962 and immediately began his explorations. He happened into a shoe store that drew his attention in the lovely city of Kobe. It belonged to a firm called Onitsuka Tiger, and the shoes they produced were of exceptionally excellent quality for the time to the point where Phil was eager to bring them back to the United States. Phil wanted to see the founders of the shoe company so badly that he called them on the phone without any prior introductions. Phil donned a suit and headed to the factory where the Japanese shoes he loved so much were made, feeling both anxious and eager. In order to prepare for his trip, he acquired a copy of how to conduct business with the Japanese and tried to learn as much of the information as he could. Phil introduced himself at the conference as an American shoe distributor who was going to assist advertise their shoes in America despite having no experience in the industry. In reality, Onitsuka had previously been seeking a strategy to market its shoes in America. They were therefore extremely happy when Phil approached them with the same concept. Maybe for that reason they were prepared to overlook the fact that Phil appeared to have just graduated from college, which he actually did. But even though he was a recent graduate in his 20s without any prior experience running a business, Phil had memorized a lot of information from his university assignment about the American shoe market. As a result, he was able to essentially recite portions of his presentation during the meeting, giving the impression that he was an expert in the field. The managers from Japan were impressed, but one of them merely asked Phil, What is the name of the company you work for? Phil noticed an unexpected increase in heart rate. Naturally, the truth was that Phil didn't have a company name because he hadn't yet established one. He simply had the insane notion to import Japanese shoes to the United States. When Phil's mind began to race, he briefly felt entirely out of his element and yearned to be back at home with his parents. At that moment, he suddenly remembered the blue ribbons from his youth that he had once displayed on his wall. During a brief pause, Phil retorted, Gentlemen, I represent Blue Ribbon Sports of Portland, Oregon. To his astonishment, the owner really agreed to Phil's offer. Phil had secured Onitsuka's Tiger's exclusive distribution rights in the States with nothing more than his self-assurance. In 1963, he received his first supply of 12 pairs of Tiger shoes, and he immediately began hawking them at any running track he could get out of the back of his automobile. But it was clear that his plan wasn't scalable, so he turned to the only person he knew who could, Bill Bowerman, his former coach at the University of Oregon, knew more about shoes than he did. Since he had worked with numerous Olympic athletes, Bill was undoubtedly one of the most well-known coaches in America at the time. He was so enamored with the Tiger shoes that he desired to be his business partner. 
Bill and Phil decided to organize Blue Ribbon Sports in January 1964, and each contributed $500 to the venture. All of the money was used to purchase 300 pairs of shoes from their initial order, which cost $3.33 each pair. Due to Bill's contacts, the shipment arrived in April 1964, and by July, it had been completely sold out. BRS sold $8,000 worth of shoes in their first year, and Phil began employing salespeople with that money to grow his business. After seeing a rise in earnings to $20,000 in 1965, they quickly launched their very own store in Santa Monica. Yet while Phil ran the business end of things, Bill was the one who was actually coming up with new ideas. He was the person who introduced jogging to the United States on his own. He published a book on it in 1966 that went on to sell over a million copies, and of course his business was one of the first to begin producing Tiger running shoes. With each new shipment from Onitsuka, Barrowman would tear apart a few pair of shoes to inspect the construction. He was always looking for ways to make things better, like adding more cushioning or utilizing lighter materials. He was essentially developing Onitsuka shoes for Japan by sending them messages all the time asking for improvements. The Cortez, as he dubbed it, became one of the best-selling shoes in 1968, presumably as a result of the 1968 Olympics, which were hosted in Mexico. It was one of Bill's ideas that launched BRS into the spotlight. BRS sold $300,000 worth of shoes in 1969 because of the Cortez, but they faced a significant challenge because the Cortez was so popular that they were unable to meet demand. Every new shipment they received was more in demand than the one before, yet Onitsuka continued to supply them at a glacial rate. In reality, Onitsuka was first meeting domestic demand in Japan before sending the remainder to America. Phil and Bill were aware that in order to grow, they would have to go beyond merely being distributors. They then understood they were in control because the Cortex was Barrowman's invention, meaning they could begin producing it for themselves as soon as their agreement with Onitsuka expired. For their benefit, their contract would expire in 1972, just in time for the Munich Olympics. Phil therefore had plenty of time to plan his major move. He began developing the trademark in 1971, and his first worker recommended naming the company Nike after the Greek goddess of victory. So, when Phil required a logo, he went to a nearby institution, grabbed the first student he could find studying graphic design, who was named Carolyn Davidson, and asked her to create one for him. He acquired the swoosh for the astounding sum of $35. In retrospect, that money was well spent, and Phil was now prepared for the Olympics with this new branding. This time, Phil built a network of subcontractors throughout Japan rather than securing exclusive contracts. Phil could finally expand his wings once he had production under his control. In fact, Phil began importing shoes from his Japanese subcontractors before his contract even ended in 1971, as shown in this graph of Nike sales. Here's a bit of history for you. With the release of the movie Air, which is based on the relationship Nike forged with Michael Jordan to produce the Nike Air sneaker, which is undoubtedly the most popular sneaker in history, do you know who was the first Nike athlete to sign with the company? American long-distance runner Steve Prefontaine, better known to his supporters as Pre, participated in the 1972 Munich Olympics. Prefontaine was born in Coos Bay, Oregon on January 25, 1951. At a young age, he was an avid runner, and with time and talent, he became one of the nation's most dominant athletes. Prefontaine established many records in his brief career, and rose to prominence as a representative of the counterculture movement in sports. Prefontaine first encountered Bowerman when he was a track and field coach at the University of Oregon, where Prefontaine was a student athlete. Prefontaine was coached by Bowerman, and the two men formed a strong bond that would influence both of their careers. Prefontaine was among the first athletes to sign a sponsorship agreement with Nike, and he swiftly rose to the position of Ambassador Supreme for the brand. His unrelenting pursuit of greatness, and his readiness to take chances and question the status quo, were perfectly in line with the brand culture of Nike. 
Prefontaine and Nike formed a collaboration based on a common vision for the future of athletics. It was more than just a business arrangement. Nike was greatly impacted by Prefontaine. The Nike Pre Montreal Racer, the brand's first ever signature shoe, was introduced with his assistance in 1973. Bowerman constructed the shoe, drawing inspiration from the shoes he had made for Prefontaine. The Pre Montreal Racer was a great hit and contributed to Nike, becoming a significant force in the athletic footwear market. Nike's history was one of success. The Just Do It advertising and the hiring of inexperienced players, who would go on to becoming internationally recognized, helped them grow into the top sportswear business in America in 1989. Don't believe me? Phil Knight's autobiography, which was published in 2016, can attest to the fact that the rise of Nike is a tale every bit as fascinating as Phil Knight's early years. That concludes today's video on YT Pioneers. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you share it around and hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, if you haven't already, for more informative and inspirational content. You can expect my next video very soon, as usual, and until then, stay smart!